Um, I'm so glad to have everybody from different parts of the world, and I think it represents the, the real international arena of all the indigenous people. And um, I'm very glad to be here today and uh, explain about our work and also have a uh, dialogue with you and um, have some feedback and uh, discussion um, after our presentation. So first I will be explaining about the general work that we do on indigenous people and the principles and guidelines. And then I'll pass it on to Lucy to inform about the uh, work of the Indigenous People Advisory Group. So the overview, I will talk about the background, I'll talk about the projects and portfolio with Indigenous people at the Jeff, and then the principles and guidelines. So I think uh, many of you already know, but uh, GEF is the largest uh, public funder of project um, to improve global environment. Um, it is a financial mechanism for the, not only for the Convention on Biodiversity, um, but also for climate change and combating desertification and POPs. And recently the Mercury Convention, they're having a meeting right now in Kumamoto in Japan. So we are basically the financial mechanism for all the key um, environmental agreements. And I'll explain to you what it means to be a financial mechanism, but I don't think with this audience I need much explanation. But uh, we've been uh, supporting more than 10.5 billion over the past 20 years of our existence since Rio Summit. Um, there's been 2,700 projects and supported 165 countries. We only finance developing countries. I think that's a really important point to emphasize. This is a mechanism that uh, the donors um, channel the money through the GEF and reach out to the developing countries to implement based on the gui guidance of the convention. So that's how it works. And um, as you can see, there are six focal areas that we work in. Um, and actually, I'm a program manager in biodiversity. That's why my biggest engagement is in CBD, of course. But I serve as a focal point on indigenous peoples um, in the Jeff uh, as a whole. And um, obviously, I would explain that the biggest portfolio on indigenous people is with biodiversity. The climate change and adaptation area is increasing. But uh, we've had uh, long uh, experience working with indigenous people since its establishment. And uh, just to introduce myself a little bit, since I didn't do it in the beginning, um, I've been with the GF for about nine years now. Um, I used to work at UNDP and WWF in the country level in Mongolia and Nepal. Worked with indigenous people on the ground for protected area management and biodiversity conservation. And so I've known a couple of you um, since those at time as well. And um, I do have two hats on top of that, uh, in, in addition to my biodiversity um, responsibility, but the indigenous people portfolio as well as the gender portfolio. So some of you who have mentioned the indigenous people and gender initiative, this is something very close to my heart as well. Okay, so participation of indigenous people at the JEF. Um, I, we can categorize um, in general four areas. So it's access to JEF funds for projects on the ground. That's uh, <coughs> definitely a big portion of indigenous people's involvement. But also, um, even, even you're not accessing directly, there's been a lot of JEF projects that indigenous people were part of it in terms of protected area management or mainstreaming biodiversity in agriculture or forestry and the traditional knowledge of indigenous people have been um, utilized and uh, disseminated in those projects as well. So those are projects that have involvement of indigenous people. And then the third category is um, indigenous people's involvement in our operation, in our policy. So we do have a mechanism in our decision making, we call it a council, the board. Um, there is representative from the indigenous people, uh, I'll explain later, but it, Estar was a really key person to make sure that the indigenous people's seat to be secured in this decision-making body. And Lucy actually took over after that. And so there's been a representation of indigenous people in our decision-making um, process as well. And also, obviously, you are here in the COP process, I mean, CBD process, where you're providing guidance to the Jeff and that translate into our strategy and implementation. So how that's also a big portion of it, the IIFB and the others who have been providing guidance to the, the CBD process and the COP is, is uh, vital for 
where we focus our initiative as well. So just to give you some snapshot on what uh, our experience for the past 20 years has been, um, in addition to the small grants program, which I will explain a little bit more, we have a medium-sized project and full-size project, which is above $2 million. And we have, for those category, we have 160 project plus that we have worked with indigenous people. Um, I must say the 160 project doesn't have equal sort of involvement of indigenous people. There are quite a number of them, which is um, about 17% of it was significant involvement of indigenous people, meaning that the indigenous people themselves were the executing, implementing agency on the ground. So they got the funding directly, they, they initiated the activity. The moderate and limited is, is where indigenous people were part of the project. Maybe one component of the bigger protected area project was on uh, working with indigenous people's uh, sort of co-management of protected areas or working on um, agriculture practices, um, learning from traditional knowledge, that kind of projects. So there are different categories or involvement of indigenous people until now. And in terms of types of indigenous people's uh, projects, Half of the portfolio is mainly protected area and the co-management and working on the buffer zone. Another category of work is mainstreaming, meaning that uh, working on the production landscape, on forestry, agriculture, tourism, working together with indigenous people. So there are um, two big categories, almost 50-50, and then there is another a very small, small portion, which is more um, on the... Uh, good practices sharing, meaning that there was one project actually we supported indigenous people's participation in capacity building in the CBD process as well as lesson sharing on uh, different uh, project initiative. So there are um, different categories. And then in terms of distribution, um, Latin America and Asia is the largest portion of our program. Um, Africa is following and actually increasing more. and. Um, in terms of uh, distribution of uh, agency, we actually, GEF, do not implement on the ground directly. We work through different agencies, meaning uh, World Bank or UN, UN organizations. So World Bank and UNDP has been our largest partners who have worked on the ground with indigenous peoples and other partners to implement the projects. And the size of the project here, as it shows, um, two-thirds was full-size project, which is above um, uh, two million. And then medium size is below two million. And there is another category called Smalls Grant Program, which is not in this uh, statistics right now, but I'll explain. But it's below $50,000, and it's managed in the country level. And I, I'm sure many of you have been involved in those. Um, just to give you a highlight of projects, as I mentioned, the Small Grants Program, they have uh, supported more than 12,000 projects by now in uh, 120 countries. And 15% um, of these projects actually was granted to indigenous people. And there are other projects that I've been uh, highlighting here, like the Protected Area Project in Rwanda, um, in the... Um, um, the Verunga and the, um, it's the uh, other side of the name, uh, the Volcano National Park. Um, there was uh, indigenous people's involvement in this project to protect the forest and protect the protected area together. And many of the indigenous people were working as the um, rangers and the steward of those uh, natural resources. Um, I think many of you know about the Integrated Ecosystem Management Project in Central America. This is a regional project where um, we worked uh, in seven countries in Central America to share the traditional knowledge <coughs> and revive it and uh, utilize those techniques and technologies on the ground to protect uh, biodiversity in, in agriculture and forestry and other production lands. And the last part, the knowledge management sharing project is the one that I mentioned earlier, which we supported Indigenous Peoples Network to 
participate in CBD and other processes and have capacity building, particularly to women participants. And I think Lucy was really involved in that process together with Mini Degawan and others. The International Alliance was leading this work. Okay, just to give you a snapshot again on the policies that we had. Um, we have started in 1991, our process, and in 1996, we developed a public involvement policy. This was one of the innovative sort of policy then, where we clarify that stakeholder participation is really vital in oral project cycle, and notably indigenous people, indigenous and local communities, as well as women, and I think youth was also mentioned as well. Um, to be fully involved in the project cycle and consulted and in the, all the project cycle from project development till evaluation, you know, um, stakeholder participation to be secure. But over the years, um, while we were having dialogue with indigenous people, of course there was this uh, desire to have a separate um, uh, policy and guideline on indigenous people. So that's how last year, in September 2012, uh, we worked almost two years to develop this guideline and uh, had it endorsed by our council, our CEO basically, um, as, a, as a principles and guidelines of our work with indigenous people. Um, principles and guidelines is one thing, but it really needs to translate into our work. So how we do that is basically the focal area strategy, like. Um, we have a biodiversity focal area strategy for the four years. So what are we going to invest and what are we going to work on with the partners? And for the, in those, we try to incorporate indigenous people's elements in it. For example, the ICCA, the Integrated Conservation um, Approach, is also part of the biodiversity strategy as well as the ABS also mentions about indigenous people's capacity building. Um, the, on the mainstreaming side and sustainable use side, we also know about the traditional knowledge. So that's how we make sure that the elements on indigenous people issues are included in our strategy and be translated into projects. And once it comes to the project level, we have a template that uh, the proponents prepare. And those templates um, include a section on how you consulted and how you worked with indigenous people and other uh, stakeholders. So that's how we make sure that uh, all the proponents who develop a project, as well as we at the Jeff Secretariat who reviews it, make sure that indigenous people were adequately consider, um, consulted and participated in the project development. So this is just, uh, I'll skip it, but we, we had uh, actually a team of indigenous people working together to develop this principle and guidelines. And um, we had a couple of workshops at the regional level, and I think some of you have been involved on those, on the consultation, and really come up with, first of all, we had an issues paper from the indigenous people, and based on that, we developed the principles and guideline document. So some of the main part of the principle is, is built on our existing um, policies and um, we have clarified and pulled together all the key elements in one document. And the respect for indigenous peoples and their human rights and cultural uniqueness is fully recognized and also the full and effective participation of indigenous people in the project cycle is also noted and uh, activities to be transparent and full documented. And the key part was this, of course, the free prior and informed consent. And there was quite a bit of back and forth. And um, basically, as an intergovernmental organization, we um, said that uh, the countries who have ratified the ILO 169 and also the countries with legislation on FPIC, we would make sure that the project uh, follow the, the legislation and um, um, adequate, uh, the appropriate procedure to be followed. And then also to have an indigenous people focal point like me and also a conflict resolution commissioner whenever there is any conflict, you can have this uh, sort of ombudsman type of person in our office who you can go to. And the guideline further clarifies more, more detail about developing um, uh, indigenous people plan 
if there is an indigenous people uh, peoples involved in the project to have appropriate plan up front so that uh, we clarify the roles and responsibilities as well as um, in, in appropriate the ethic to be uh, conducted at that stage. And then the, um, uh, we also clarified in this uh, guideline about the full and effective participation and also the criteria for um, indigenous status and how we identify it. We basically follow the um, same definition that has been used by many other in, um, international organizations like the World Bank and, um, and also recognize 